let me uh, start by talking a little bit about the assignment number two um, <clears throat> which was issued last night i noticed that some of you guys some of the wizards have already done that but for the rest of you marbles let's spend a few minutes talking about it and giving you some hints uh, once we're done with that we will continue talking about the complexity of algorithms and that, as you can imagine, is going to be the main theme of this course, is talking about the complexity of different data structures, different operations, and different algorithms. <laughs> um, next, we will start talking about a completely new data structure. Uh, so far, we've only looked at array data structure, and so now, today, we will introduce linked lists, which is a completely alternate way of handling data. Uh, I don't think we'll actually get to the complexity comparisons, but let's see how far we get. So, um, assignment number two, I hope uh, quite a few of you have actually looked at it. Um, basically, uh, this is going to make sure that you know how to get input from the data, from the user, uh, to be able to handle different data types when users are putting in uh, integers versus double versus strings, and then to be able to manipulate that inside arrays. So you will be required to put in that data inside arrays um, and then manipulate that data according to the kind of uh, results that are needed. We will also be using some static methods which are defined as part of the starter code. <laughs> so uh, let me give you a real quick overview of this assignment. So this is basically about processing manufacturing data and we give you some sample data and the sample data has the following format. So the first thing that you as a user of this application will put in is the number of items. Okay, so here the first entry is the number of items and here you're basically putting in six items which corresponds to each one of these lines. For each item, uh, you will put in a single line a number of fields. The first field is data, sorry, date, uh, time, and category. These are all three strings. Uh, subsequent to that, you will put in a fee. This fee corresponds to sort of the price that you sell in this particular item at. Okay? The fee that you're charging. Um, next, you put in the quantity. So, the quantity is for this particular item. So, we're basically saying that 593 laptops were sold at a price of 41. Yet another batch of laptops can also be seen over here. These were sold for a different price or a different fee and a different quantity. Okay. So for each one of these items, there's a category. And to make life simple, we've simply um, said that you need to handle three categories. And these are phones, laptops, and smartwatches. Um, and these are going to be given to you in the starter code. Next, um, you have a time field. So you have two time fields. The first one is basically a string. The second one is a real number. And this time field basically corresponds to the amount of time it takes to assemble this particular item and it also relates to how much the laborers or the workers are going to charge and they charge based on a certain flat rate which is $16 an hour. So all of these details are already given to you. I'm just sort of giving you an overview. So uh, the amount, the cost of this particular item is in two parts. The first part corresponds to the labor cost and that is based on this time. So for 384.5 hours, uh, you have to multiply that with the wage rate, which is $16 an hour. That's given to you. Okay? That gives you one part of the cost of producing this item. The second cost is the assembly cost. Okay? So if you add these two components together, you get the total cost. All right. Now, um, the first part 
of this assignment is fairly easy. You've got to take this data and you've got to be able to produce an output corresponding to the highest and the lowest fee. So if you enter all of this data into an array, how big is the array going to be? Well, you are specifying the number of items. So what you can do is specify the size of the array corresponding to the number of items. And there will be multiple arrays. Okay, so for, for each one of these fields, there will be a different array because they are different data types. Right? So once you've defined all of these arrays, now you've got to search for the fee which is the highest versus the lowest. So if you look through this, the first fee uh, for the laptops for batch 1 is 41, the next one is 20, the next one is 49, and this as you can see is the highest fee. And so uh, this particular uh, batch is reported as having the highest fee and you simply report the date, the first three fields, the date, time one, and the category, and then you specify the fee as well. So you're simply reproducing the data. Uh, and the next um, set corresponds to the lowest fee. So as you go down this list, you should be able to see that uh, the smartwatch, uh, the last item has the lowest fee, which is 12.18. Um, and, sit, and you simply have to print out the four fields corresponding to the other one. So that was the first part, which is hopefully relatively easy. The second part is a little trickier. And in this, what you have to do is produce statistics based on the category. Now, there are three categories, phones, laptops, and smartwatches. So what you need to do is to be able to do some totals and some calculations on that particular category, right? So the way we have suggested in the starter code is that you create another set of arrays in which you are keeping track of the totals, okay? So for example, for the phone, you will total up the total quantity, right? So the, there are three things, three statistics that are required. The first one being the total quantity. So the form, which corresponds to the first category, has to be printed out first. And what you'll do is, in the second set of arrays, you'll keep track of the total quantity. 3606, 541, that corresponds to 3606. And 541, you add that up, keep track in a separate array, and that gives you the total quantity. The total fee then has to be calculated based on the total quantity and the fees. So the total fee, uh, as you can imagine, uh, will be a weighted sum. You will take the fee and multiply it by the quantity. The fee multiplied by the quantity and that gives you the total fee. The total average fee is simply taking the total amount and dividing it by the quantity so that's per unit so that gives you the second statistic right. the third one is a little trickier and that's the net profit per unit the net profit per unit is essentially the total revenue which is the total fee that you're collecting which you've already calculated minus the total cost now as i said there are two components to the cost. There's the assembly cost and there is the labor cost. Okay, so you add up these two components, you multiply the, the labor cost by the wages, the wage rate, and you can sum these up to get the total cost. So your profit naturally is your total fee and is the total cost. And if you want to get that per unit, item, so you simply divide that by the number of units, which is from here, 9007. So this was an example for the first uh, case of phones, and this is already given to you. So um, you can do the rest, and you can figure it out. Um, 
The one thing that is very particular to this assignment, unfortunately, which we promise will not be there for the subsequent assignments, is that it is very particular to the actual format that you're putting in. So unfortunately, if you give the result, for example, you say 13.68. Now you're calculating this as 13.68 and you do the rounding of them slightly differently. And your, yours comes out to 13.69. Well, the grade score is not going to like that. Okay? If you don't specify the right number of significant digits, so you could say 13.7, for example, it won't like that either. So everything has to be meticulously exactly corresponding to the output that, you, that we've given you. Okay? This is uh, one of the unfortunate aspects of grade score. It doesn't give you partial credit um, when there could have been some. Um, however, if you do the first part correctly, for example, um, and I suggest that you do it in part, so you do the first part and upload it and see if you get some credit, you should be able to get something like 50% or 50 out of 100 points. And then if you get the second part right, then you should be able to get all 100 points. Okay. So um, this uh, assignment, depending on your level of um, programming experience, uh, can be a little tricky. So I would suggest that you do please start early. Um, it is due in a week. Uh, if you get stuck at any point, please make sure that you go and get help. Okay. Uh, and the office hours are available and the, the LAs are there to help you. So this was sort of an overview of the assignment. Um, and if there are no questions, I'm going to now continue on with the topic for today. So, continuing on with complexity of algorithms. So, we, this was uh, the point where we stopped in the last lecture, where we were giving you an example of a linear search. And we said that um, a linear search can have a variety of complexities, depending on what exactly are you talking about. When you don't specify, the then the default is you're talking about the worst case. So, in the worst case, uh, for the for the search, we saw that it corresponded to the curve B1, which was linear, and so the order of complexity was big O of n. For the best case, it was corresponding to curve C, which we discussed in the last lecture, which corresponds to big O of 1. For the average case, that was a little tricky. Well, we knew that it was somewhere in between probably half of B1. So you might venture to say, well, that seems to be big O of n upon 2. So if you specify big O of n upon 2 in an exam setting or in homework, uh, while that seems to be correct, it's not completely correct and you won't get full credit. In order to get full credit, you have to simplify that in the simplest form. Okay? So you need to simplify and you have to realize that the big O notation it removes the constants. So big O of n upon 2 is actually big O of n. Okay? So to get full credit, you need to specify it in the simplest form. So um, let's move on from this. And let's take a look at um, a use case as, a, as an, at an example, where let's say you have two algorithms, and we're telling you that the time complexity of one of them is order of n squared and that of the algorithm b is order of n. But now, if I, if I recall, I mentioned at the beginning of the semester at some point that just like you have time complexity, you could also have space complexity. Okay? Space complexity simply means the amount of space you're taking up either in the RAM or on the hard disk. Okay? So just like we have a time complexity notation, the same notation can be applied to space complexity. So let's say the algorithm A has a space complexity given by S of n as opposed to T of n of order of n squared and a space complexity for the algorithm B is big O of n. So if I were to ask you which algorithm is better, then your answer should be fairly clear. Right. Certainly, algorithm B is superior both in terms of time as well as space. Right. However, that's not always the case. 
in real life, what you'll see is algorithms which have competing performance. Okay, so here's an example. Now let's say for the same task, you have two algorithms A and B given the same input n. The time complexity of algorithm A is order of n squared. The time complexity of algorithm B is order of n. So clearly algorithm B is superior in terms of time. However, the space complexity of algorithm A is order of n and the space complexity of order of algorithm B is order of n squared. So now you have a problem. Which algorithm is better? Because in time complexity, algorithm B is better, but in space complexity, algorithm A is better. So if you had to decide, and you, let's say you had a project and you had two possible algorithms to work with, you've come up with two algorithms to solve the same problem, which algorithm would you choose? And why? Any thoughts? And would it depend? It would depend perhaps on your particular circumstances. But can you come up with um, a reason why you choose one over the other? In real life, let's say you have a real project to do, yeah? Very good. So, if you are working with um, a limited amount of memory, right, and your algorithm is taking up a fairly huge amount of memory, and all of a sudden you realize that um, if you are working with algorithm B, you're running out of space. Okay? So, if you're running out of space and your algorithm is crashing, then you're going to work with algorithm A. Now, in this case, it may not crash, but it may take a long time. So basically, and can I get your name, sorry? Andy? So Andy's suggestion depends on the scenario, right? So can you come up with another scenario where we would prefer a different solution? Can you think of different scenarios in real life? Let's say you have a project and it could be either due tomorrow or it could be due at the end of the semester. So if it's due tomorrow, which algorithm would you choose? And if it's due at the end of the semester, or you know, different scenarios, you can think of different scenarios. So, so hopefully it's kind of obvious. If you are under a time constraint, then you want to work with an algorithm where time is as the lower complexity. Okay, so in that case, we'd work with algorithm B. But if algorithm B um, runs out of space, then you have a problem. So if you have a space constraint, whichever constraint comes out first, that's the algorithm that will decide which algorithm you choose. Okay, and in real life, what you'll see is that um, if you look at different algorithms, uh, for example, a sorting algorithm, you'll see that. Um, if you compare different sorting algorithms, what you'll see is that some algorithms uh, may be the fastest and other algorithms may be not as fast, but they may uh, require more space. Okay, so there could be a space versus time trade-off. So both of these algorithms would be reported as the best in their category. So okay, one might be the best in terms of time, another one might be the best in terms of space. And both of them become important. Okay. So um, let's move on. And now let's take a look at the search example that we discussed in the last lecture, where we said, well, here is what is referred as a linear search. Okay, so this was an algorithm which was quite simplistic. And it said, well, let's say that you have an array and you have a certain key that you're looking for inside the array. And one way that we did, um, and it was sort of similar to what we did in the USMS example, is that we simply searched through the entire array, looking for that key. And we started with the first element and went all the way till the end. And as soon as we found something, we did a return. But um, as we discussed in the last lecture, imagine if you use this algorithm to do a search on Google, right? And Google typically responds by saying, you know, they've uh, traversed to one gigabyte 
half space or something and they responded in a fraction of a second. So obviously they are not using a linear search, okay? Linear search would have serious problems. So obviously we can think of better algorithms and um, can anybody think of a better algorithm to do a search? What could be a better way of searching? For example, if you have a phone directory on your mobile phone, you can imagine that if you do a search, it probably doesn't do a linear search, right? Uh, what do you think it does and why and how? Yes. Binary search and why can it do it by binary search? How and how? So you, you have some idea for binary search, right? Can you sort of explain that? Right. Exactly, exactly. Can I get your name, sorry? Sai, so I'm going to show you that, okay? Sai Nanya. Okay, got that. So, um, Sai Nanya mentioned that you could do a binary search, and one of the things that you mentioned was that your data has to be sorted, right? So, this sort of, I don't know if any of you have actually used a physical dictionary. Has anybody even used a physical dictionary these days? Oh, wow. Right. What did you use it for, by the way? Nowadays. Okay, so, I mean, dictionaries have gotten out of trend, but if you use learning a foreign language, uh, sometimes dictionaries are still useful. In the old days, what used to happen is that you'd have a nice thick dictionary, and you're looking up a particular word, and you say, well, this word begins with a Z, and so, or let's say an R, and you would open up the dictionary in the middle, and you'd say, well, what am I looking for? Uh, is that below, or is that after? before okay so so r is before so r is let's say after the letter that you find so you uh, open up the second portion of that dictionary and then keep dividing it up into smaller and smaller halves okay that is what is being referred to as a binary search why binary because every time what you do is you take your data space and you divide it into two and then subsequently you divide it again into two and yet again into two and the reason why you can do that is because the data is sorted, right? So if your dictionary wasn't sorted, it was all jumbled up, you will know where to look for it. Okay, right? then you have to do a linear search. So let's assume that somehow we are going to do a, a binary search and we have somehow we have the data sorted, okay? So let's see how binary search would work. But before we get to the binary search, let's try to create what is referred to as a flow chart for our linear search. And this is going to be useful because every time you write an algorithm, if you write it in the form of a flowchart, it becomes easier to understand and comprehend. Okay? So here's a flowchart. I'm sure all of you have seen flowcharts um, before. So here's a flowchart which is sort of human readable and shows you the flow of data for this linear search algorithm. We start off <clears throat> by specifying a block which says start. You start over here, you are given an array A, you're given a key, and now you go through this particular block of code where you're basically saying uh, we are now implementing the for loop. Okay, so this, these blocks in the flowchart are essentially in, uh, showing you how the for loop works. How does it work? Well, initially you have i is equal to zero, and that's specified over here. Uh, we don't specify the actual format detail, so we don't specify the data type over here because generally flowcharts are supposed to be simplified versions, okay? So not all the details of the, of the actual syntax are shown, you don't have the semicolons and the, and the parentheses and so on. Um, the next thing that you do is you check whether i is less than the length of the array. So whenever you have a decision point, that's generally shown as a diamond. Right? Why? Because then you have either a yes or a no or a true or a false uh, response to the query. And so in this case, let's say that i is less than the length. In that case, you simply go to the next block. Again, you have another query. 
and you say is a equal to a sub i equal to the key. And that's what we're doing in here. Okay, so this is the main body of the for loop. And if that is not true, then you go ahead and you do an increment, which is basically what we're doing over here. Okay, so you can see that now we've basically taken the for loop, broken it up into uh, four different blocks, and you can sort of see how the flow is, uh, is working inside the for loop. At some point, you either find the key, in which case you return a true, or you get to the end of the array and you return a false. Okay, so that is uh, a very simple flow chart for a very simple algorithm. And we're going to use that to be able to see how a binary search flow chart would look like. Okay, so let's say that you had to write a binary search. Um, so first, the first thing we're going to assume is that the data is sorted. Now, how we get the data to be sorted is the topic of a whole series of lectures normally, and we will spend at least one lecture on that towards the end of the course. How do you sort data? Okay. For right now, we're just going to assume that somehow we know through a magical method that the data can be sorted. And so let's say this was your original data. We're going to assume that it is given to us in a sorted manner. So all these numbers are in ascending order or non-descending order. Now, how can we do a binary search on this? So here's a flow chart. So in the flow chart, what you can see is, and I'm going to use an example. So let's say that your array is given over here. It has a length of seven, and the key that we're searching for is the number 10. So here's the modified version of the flow chart. Again, we start over here and we have the array given and the key given. Now, instead of starting from i is equal to zero, we're going to start from the middle of the array. How do we know where the middle of the array is? If you're given an array, how do we figure out the middle of the array? Somebody else? If you're given an array, yeah? Length divided by two, right? And that comes out to be a non-integer, then you either take the ceiling or the floor. Okay, so let's assume that we're going to take the floor. I haven't specified uh, the details over here, but that is sort of, uh, you know, in, in, in the flow chart, a lot of times you don't specify all the details. Okay, so this is sort of giving you a rough idea of how the algorithm works. So basically it's saying that you get to the middle of the array. And so in this case, uh, the length is seven, so we take the floor of the uh, divided by seven divided by two and the floor of that, so that's three. Um, and then we say, well, is the element at this particular location at the third value? So zero, one, two, three, is this particular element equal to the key that we're looking for? Okay, here's the element, and the key that we're looking for is number 10. So clearly, they're not equal. So we go to the next block, say no, and now we do a comparison to be able to figure out whether the number that we're looking for is going to be in the lower half of the array or in the top half. And because it's sorted, we can do that. If it wasn't sorted, we couldn't do that. Because it's sorted, we can say, well, if a sub i, if the number six is less than the number 10, which it is in this case, then now we're going to go through this portion. And now we're going to say, well, we're going to cut down our search space into half. Okay, because we obviously know that the number we're looking for is going to be in the top half. So now I'm going through a process in which what I'm doing is I'm taking the original A and I'm redefining it to be just the top portion. Okay, so A has now been redefined to be the top half of the original A. So now A becomes equal to a smaller array, which is only 10, 20, and 25. Now we repeat the same process again. We go through this loop, we come back over here, we set um, i to be the middle of the new array. So i is now going to be 3 divided by 2, which is 1.5, and we take the, the floor, which is 1. And then we say, well, is the element at location 1, index location 1, which is 20, is that smaller? 
or larger than the key that we're looking for? Well, in this case, we're going to go to the other portion. Okay, so the answer is going to be no over here. And now we're going to look at the bottom half. So in other words, we can see that the number 10 is either going to be absent from this array or it's going to be in the lower half of this new array. So as you can see now, what we're basically doing is in every iteration, we're cutting the size of the array into half. Okay? And so finally, we get to the third equation where we have the new array simply equal to the lower portion of this array and we say that 10 is equal to 10. So we found what we're looking for and we turn it to. Okay, is that a question? So um, this is sort of a high level view of the binary search. But um, at this point, would you be able to actually write a code for this? Um, it would be a little tricky. Why is that? Because you probably don't have enough information about Java or know enough about Java to be able to do some of the operations. Like, how do you take A and reassign it to be the top half? Okay, so that's a little tricky. We have to do, we need to know more about Iris to be able to do that. But maybe you, you all did not. But in any case, the point of, of a flowchart is to give you the high level view. And sometimes it's very useful to be able to write a flowchart before you actually write, especially if it's a very complex algorithm. If it's a large algorithm and you have five people working on it, and you have to divide up the problem between five people, it's a good idea to well write a flowchart and say, well, I'm going to work on this part of, of the algorithm and you guys work on the other part and so on. It also gives you a, a mechanism to make sure that the algorithm doesn't have any flaws. Um, speaking of flaws, does this have one? Is, is this algorithm as described uh, complete or not? May not be complete, but because all the details are not there. But is there a fundamental problem with this algorithm? Yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't return false. It's supposed to return a true or a false. So if the key is not present, this is simply going to, um, it's, it's not going to work, right? So you need to be able to introduce something which makes sure that you have a way to stop at the end of the tutorial, okay? So what you could do is introduce some check to make sure that if the index, if the size of the array is actually all the way down to a single element, and you still haven't found what you're looking for, then you've done it false. Okay. So if you didn't specify that in an algorithm, in a full chart, uh, that couldn't deserve full points, right? because that's technically a flaw in the actual full chart. If you didn't specify all the details over here, you could still get away with that. But uh, you have to realize that some aspects of a full chart could be more critical than others. So having understood, uh, at a high level, and we're still not implementing it in Java, but understood it at a high level, let's try to grapple with the issue of the complexity. Okay, so why are we going to a binary search as compared to a linear search? It's basically because we thought it would be faster, right? Because basically said, clearly it's going to take too long to be able to search through a huge amount of data, and if it's sorted, it will probably be faster. Okay, now how much faster will it be? Any ideas? If you did a binary search, what would be the big old notation for the complexity of the time involved to be able to search in the worst case? In the linear search, the big O was order of n. In this case, in the worst case, so you're saying it would be order of n upon 2. And as I just said, order of n upon 2 is in the simplest form, is it? It's back to order of n. So if it's really faster in terms of not the actual time, but the order of complexity, then the order of complexity notation in big O notation has to be superior or different. 
So it can't just be twice as fast. That's not good enough. When you talk about complexity, being twice as not fast is not good enough because that's basically saying it's going to take order of n upon two, and that is basically order of n complexity. So that wouldn't cut it. Yeah. Okay, very good. So can you sort of explain why it should be log to the base two of n? Okay, very good, very good. So your intuition is absolutely right. So here I have shown you an example and let's go through this. So basically what you're saying is, if you want to figure out the complexity of an algorithm, uh, it, a good way to do it is to start doing it manually and work with small examples. And this could come in real handy when you're going through 550. Okay, because in COM 550, uh, this is you know, a good chunk of the course about the complexity of different algorithms. So if you, if you can't figure it out, or if you want to make sure that your answer is correct, you go through a manual ex example. So here's a manual example to be able to figure out the complexity of this algorithm. Okay, so let's say that we start with a really small array of size one. Okay, let's assume that the array is a single element and the key that we're looking for is shown in green and is also present. So how many iterations would that take? Well, clearly that would take a single iteration to find that. Okay. Now let's double the size of the array. And now the question is how many iterations would the binary search take? So based on our previous example, we basically are going to jump to this particular location. We're going to say, well, is three equal to, equal to four? Because four is the key, that's not true. We're going to look at the top half and then find it. So that's going to take two iterations. Now we continue to double the size of the array. And now we have an array of size four. Again, we do a search, we go into the middle of the array. Four is not equal to six, which is what we're looking for. We jump to the middle of this top half. Five is not what we're looking for, and eventually we get to six. That takes three iterations. We double the size of the array yet again, and now we're looking for the number 26, the worst case. We jump to the middle of the array, six is not 26, and then we jump to the middle of the top half, 20 is not equal to 26, we jump again, and jump again, and you can see that eventually we get four equations. Now we jump, we double the size of the array yet again, and now you can see that the number of iterations is increasing incrementally by one every time when we double the size of the array. So here we're going to jump to the middle of the array again, and then since 82 is bigger, we are again going to look at the top half, and we're going to jump somewhere to the middle of the array, and then we're going to jump yet again to the middle of the top half, and so on. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five. So now we have five iterations in the worst case. So you can see that every time we're doubling the size of the array, the number of iterations to find the, in the worst case is only going up incrementally by one. And so now, as the gentleman suggested, there you can see a relationship between the number of iterations and the size of the array. And it seems there seems to be a logarithmic relationship. What is exactly is the relationship? Well, let's take a look at the next slide. Basically, you can figure out that this is 2 to the power 3, this is 2 to the power 4, and so on. And so 3 and 4 and 4 and 5 are off by 1. So you should be able to figure out, well, this seems to be uh, the following relationship that n is uh, that the number of iterations is basically the log of n plus 1. Right? So log of 32 is 5 plus 1 is 6. Okay? So that seems to be the relationship between the maximum iterations and uh, n. So basically we've said we can sort of conclude that the worst case expression for the amount of iterations which corresponds to the amount of time 
that's going to be taken by this, by this binary search is log to the base 2 of n plus 1. But we haven't yet expressed that as a big O notation. Right? So we need to convert that into a big O notation. So now what I'm telling you is that the big O notation for this corresponds to the following expression which has made two simplifications. The first simplification is that we remove the plus one. And the second simplification, which you may not note, is that we're dropping the base of the log. Okay? So, any thoughts? Why are we dropping those two things? Going back to the big notation. Why are we dropping the plus one and why are we dropping the base of the log? When you're trying to express that same equation as a bigger notation, yes. Very good. So n becomes extremely large, then the plus one term becomes irrelevant, so you can drop that. That's the first part of the simplification. What about the base? Any thoughts on that? Or anybody else? Why do you think we're dropping the base of the log in the big old notation? Match conditions, yes. Okay, so I'm saying something beyond that. I'm saying that um, in the big old notation, the base is irrelevant. That's basically what I'm saying. I'm not saying that there is an implicit base 2 there. I'm saying that the base is irrelevant in the big O notation. And now I'm trying to figure out from you guys why do you think that's the case? Yes. So you're absolutely right. And basically what you're saying is that log to the base 2 and log to the base 10 are related to each other by a constant. Okay? And that's the key. That is a constant. And it's, it's independent of n. Right? So if you look at the next slide, what you can see is that log to the base x of any number n and log to the base y of the same number are related to each other by a constant. And that constant is simply log to the base x of y. Okay. So in other words, if you have log to the base 10 of n and log to the base 2 of n, they are related to each other by a constant. This constant is independent of n. It's independent of n. And so essentially, Regardless of which log, which base log of n you use, all of those are related to each other by constants. Now, what does that mean? Now, remember in the big O notation, when we spoke about it, we said that basically the big O notations differ among themselves by the shape of the curve. Okay? You can scale the curve up and down. That doesn't matter, but the shape of the curve has to be different. And what we're saying now is that the different logs are basically the same shape and they're simply scaled versions of each other. Okay? If you plot it log to the base 10 of n and you multiply it by a different constant, it would superimpose with log to the base 2. So they have the same shape. So that's where the intuition should, should come in. So basically what we're saying is that the, the base doesn't really matter. The shape of log to the log of n is always the same. The base will only change the actual value by a constant. Okay? And remember, constants don't matter. So you can simply drop this constant. So if this was big O of this whole thing, so this was big O of all of this, then the multiplication constant, as we know, can be dropped. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're simply dropping the multiplication 
in front of the dollar. So basically what we're saying is that in the big O expressions, the base of the log is irrelevant. Okay, just like the constant multiplications are ir irrelevant. And similarly, just like the this summation of other terms become irrelevant. Okay. Now you might say, well, in real life, don't those constants matter? If you have an algorithm which is has the same shape, but one algorithm is ten times faster than the other, then in real life, shouldn't that matter? Yes, in real life, that does matter. But in complexity, when you're talking about complexity, you look, you those things become irrelevant. You sort of simplify things. And you're simply looking at the shape of the curve. Okay, so it's a major simplification. And when you hit real life, uh, your boss may not be too happy if you give, you know, an algorithm which is ten times slower, and you say, well, the complexity is the same. Right? So in real life, things are different. But when you're talking about complexity, uh, we're going to ignore the constants. Okay? And we'll come back to this issue uh, perhaps over and over again in this course. All right, another key factor when we're saying that the binary search has a complexity of order of log n, and this is really critical for this course, is that we made a statement over here, and we're saying, well, when you're doing this lookup, is a sub i equal to the key. That operation, we basically, in our minds, we know that if it's an array, then it's the amount of time taken is constant in the sense that it, it's independent of n. Okay? The time to look up an element in an, in an array is independent of the size of the array. Can somebody tell me why that is the case? This goes back to one of our earlier lectures. If I give an array which was a thousand, a thousand elements, and another array which has hundred thousand elements, in order to look up a specific element, let's say the fiftieth element, what I'm basically saying, the amount of time to look up the fiftieth element is independent of the actual size of the array. Why is that the case? Think back to your some of your earlier lectures. Why is the amount of time taken to look up an element in an array independent of the size of the array? How do you look it up? It wasn't too long ago when we discussed that. Yes. Yeah, so you have, so you should, so the compiler will know the base address of the array. If you're looking up an ith element, all it has to do is figure out the, the offset, and the offset is based on i multiplied by the size of each element. If each element is four bytes long, you basically say four times i. You add that offset to the base address, and now you have an address. And in a random access memory, which is what all of us have in our computers. Random access basically means that you can randomly access any memory location in the same amount of time. It's not linear access, all right? So in, in some of the hard disks, um, or even in some of the CDs, it's actually linear time. So in order to be able to get to a particular location, you start from the beginning and you sort of go slowly to that particular location. In random access memory, you can just jump to that particular location. And it takes you the same amount of time whether you're going to the first byte or you're going to the last byte. Okay, you can simply jump to that location. Why is that? Because you simply specify the address location in the computer architecture slide, and the RAM responds with the contents. Okay, so think back to that. So basically, this is the key. So um, the amount of time to look up the element is independent of n. And that is why we can say that the complexity is big O of log n. Right? Now, 
that is not going to be the same case for all data structures that we're going to study. Okay, so array is basically the first data structure that we studied, but to be able to look up an element for other data structures is not necessarily necessarily going to be constant, and it's not necessarily going to be independent of the size of the array, of not the array but the data structure. Okay, so that brings us to the next major topic in this course. And before we get to that, we sort of summarize that the complexity of an algorithm depends on the data structure used. Okay, so in this case, the data structure is an array, and so we can specify the complexity. But if it wasn't an array, the complexity may be completely different. Okay, and this is essentially what our course is all about. It's basically saying that we have to have the optimal data structure so that the complexity of the overall algorithm is optimal. Okay, so we're going to look at different data structures, how the data is actually stored, to make sure that it's stored in the right data structure. So let's take a look at other data structures. So, so far you probably don't have a comparison mechanism. You, you only understand arrays. So, um, let's first understand what are the pros and cons of an array. So, one of the advantages obviously is that you can access any element of the array in constant time. That's big O operation. However, the disadvantage is that the array size is fixed. Right? So, I said the arrays are static. You, every time you use an array, you have to design, you have to pre-specify. So in the USMS array example, I said that you have to assume that how many students are going to be enrolled, right? So what's the big disadvantage of that? Discuss that, right? So what do you think is a big problem in having constant size arrays? Yeah. Sorry, say that again. Yeah. So, so if let's say that, uh, you know, in the previous example, like let's say you're hypothetically expecting a thousand students to apply for the computer science department at UNC, right? So you create an array, which is maybe a lot larger, so make, maybe make it 2000, okay? Now come fall of 2024, and the applicants are coming in, and suddenly at the time of registration, the number of applicants is now 3,000. What's going to happen to your application? It's basically going to crash and burn, right? Because as soon as it crosses the limit, uh, it's going to say, well, I don't have, the, the array is full. What do I do with the 2,000 first applicant? So it's simply going to, it's going to crash. That's not a happy situation to be in, right? So the IT people could say, well, Let's create an array which is really large. What's the maximum number of students that we can expect? Well, let's say that we've never had more than one or 2,000 students, so we will play it safe and create an array which is of size 10,000, right? That will work because we'll probably never reach 10,000 applicants. But is there a disadvantage? What's the dis what are the pros and cons of that? What's the disadvantage of having an array which is 10,000? Yeah, waste of storage space, right? That storage space is critical. Your RAM, that's where it's going. So if you have your, your main server is allocating a whole bunch of space, unnecessary space to the computer science application, then the other applications are going to suffer. People are not going to love that. Right? So there's always a trade-off. So if you're using a static array, there's a trade-off. You want to make it convenient and fail safe, but then the problem is you're using up too much space. Okay? So arrays have these problems. And so you're looking for a better data structure, and there are several ways to find better data structures. Okay? And later on, we're going to look at a whole bunch of solutions, but today we're going to look at a new data structure, which sort of addresses this particular problem, and that is called linked lists. Okay, so we might have spoken about linked lists earlier, but let's try to understand what exactly is a linked list today. So this is a completely different data structure as compared to arrays. And you can think of this as a bunch of objects which are sort of strung together. 
in a chain. Okay? So let's say that you have an array, sorry, you have a linked list which comprises of four elements 1, 2, 10, and 15. But instead of putting them in a single array, in which case 1, 2, 10, and 15 are contiguous, what we're going to do now is for each one of those elements, we're going to create a separate object. Okay, just like the UN system an object that we created. So it's going to be a separate object. And as you remember, each one of those objects could actually be in a completely different location in the heap memory. Okay? So let's say this is the first object. Now this object is going to consist of different fields. One of the fields is going to be the actual value. Okay, so here is the actual value of this particular object, and we'll call this a node, right? We call it a node or an object. Let's just call it a node. So this node is going to have two parts to it in this case. The first part or the first field, you might say, of that object is going to correspond to the actual value that you want store in there. The second part is going to be a pointer. And what is a pointer? It's simply an address. So the second part is going to be a pointer to the second object. Okay. So the number two is going to have its own object. It's going to be in a different part of the heap. And it is again going to comprise of two parts. The first part of the first field is basically the contents. And the second part again is going to be a pointer or an address field which is going to point to the next object. So this seems to be a really clumsy way of storing data, right? I mean, now we have the data scattered all over the place in different objects and you have pointers. And you can imagine some of the problems, right? So earlier, if you want to access the, let's say, a particular element of this array, okay, so we want to get to, let's say, the ith element, Okay, how could we do that? Well, if it was an array, we could just use the base address and the offset. And we know the exact address and we can just jump to that location and get that content. But now we can't use that concept, right? We don't, we can't just take the base address and the offset. If you want to get to the ith element, the only way possible is that we go to the first node, we can pick up the address of the second node, and then in the second node, we pick up the address of the third node. In the third node, we pick up the address of the fourth node and so on. And so we have to go jump hop by hop until we get to the ith element. Doesn't seem very nice. Seems like a very complex way of storing things. But it has some advantages. Okay. What do you think is the advantage? Think about the array. Yeah. So one way of thinking about it is that it's more flexible, right? Now, every time, let's say you, you started off with a linked list, which was initially zero, size zero. Every time a new student applicant came in, you just create a new object, okay? And so there is no hard limit to how much space you can have in that data structure. And you could have a thousand or 10,000 or 100,000. As long as you have heap memory, you're okay. So it seems a lot more flexible. However, is the actual memory going to be the same? So if you want to store, let's say, five elements in an array versus five elements in a linked list, would the actual amount of memory be? Well, this is a little tricky question. So let me let me hold off to that later. Till later, think about that. Um, now let's take a look at how one could depict this linked list using my earlier depiction of the uh, in, a, in a table. So here, basically what we're saying is that the linked list is going to be, and we're going to use the term node for each one of those elements, comprised of a bunch of nodes. And for the head node, we're going to have a pointer which points to the head node or the first node of that linked list. And that particular pointer could be a separate variable which has its own memory. 
how much memory is each one of those pointers and address is going to take, that depends on the operating system. So let's say that we're working with 32-bit operating systems to make it simple. So 32-bit operating systems will have a memory which can be addressed using four bytes. So the head pointer, let's assume, is located at location 400. And so it would take four bytes starting from 400, 401, 2, and 3. Now, let's assume that the contents of the head pointer are now pointing to the first node. And let's assume that the first node is located at a different memory location starting at 500. Okay, so the contents of the head pointer would simply be the first starting point of the first node. Now, the first, now within this particular node, as I mentioned, there are two parts to it. The first part is the actual contents, and the second part is another address. Now, the address field we know should take four bytes because we're working with, with, with a 32 bit operating system. So, this should take four bytes. But what about the contents? Well, the contents need to be specified. So, let's assume that each one of these is an int, which is taking up four bytes. Okay. So the first field of that object is going to take four bytes, and that will correspond to 500 to 503. The next field, which corresponds to the address of the next node over here, that's also going to take up four bytes. And these two will be contiguous. These two will be contiguous. Why is that? Because that's a single object. And as we saw earlier, that the fields within the single object are next to each other, are contiguous. Okay. Um, so, as you can see in this example, um, the next address is going to point to 600, and this is going to be the location of the second node. Just like the first node, it's going to have some contents, which will take up four bytes. And then you're going to have another address pointer, which is going to point to the next node. And so on. Okay. So you can see how this entire data structure is sort of linked to each other. Nodes linked to each other. The last node, you know that, the, that this is the last node when you see that the next address or the, the pointer is actually a null pointer okay shown either as a null or sort of a pointer pointing to the ground it's sort of electrical engineering application so um, and what is null if you remember the ascii code null is a special character okay so if that character is a null then you know that the next node pointer is a null and that's the end of the chain. Okay, it's the end of the linked list. So that's how a linked list would, would, would be depicted. Uh, sometimes you not only have a head pointer, but you also have a tail pointer. Okay? So the tail pointer could itself have its own memory location, and it might be useful to have a tail pointer pointing to the last node. Okay? So now let's take a look at the different operations that you could perform. Now, in almost all data structures, there are three common operations. The first one being insertion, so you want to insert some data. The second one being deletion, so you might, may want to delete some data. And the third one could be search, okay, where you want to search for some data. So these are three operations that we're going to come back to again and again. But you could think of other operations as well, okay? That could be an operation which sort of sorts all the data. Okay, or another operation which finds the maximum integer or the minimum integer and so on. So, um, so now uh, let's take a look at an example where we want to be able to do a search. And we're saying, well, based on a previous example of an array, we may want to keep the data in a sorted manner. So we're going to say, well, let's take the same analogy of an array. And now what we're going to do is we're going to create a sorted linked list. 
Okay. So basically, we, now we have data in a linked list, but now we want to keep it sorted. In other words, if this is the linked list, the first element should be the smallest, and then the next bigger, and finally the bigger ones. Okay, so it's non uh, descending or ascending order. So let's say that we have this linked list, and now what we want to do is we want to be able to do one of the three operations. So let's talk about the first operation. Let's say that you've already got this data, and you want to do a search. How would you do a search? So let's say you want to search for the number 15. You want to be able to see whether this number 15 is present in the linked list or not. So, and you have a head pointer. Okay. So, can you just go through this just like an array? But how exactly would you go through this? How would you iterate through the contents of this array, of this linked list? How would you actually do that? Well, you basically start off with the head pointer. You say, well, now I need to go to the, we'd say, well, I'm looking for the number 15. Number 15 is not here, all right? So now I'm going to look for it in the next node. So now I'm going to look up the next node using the address field. I'm going to jump over here. And then I'm going to say, well, is the contents over here equal to 15? No. Now I'm going to look up the address field of the next node, jump over here and say, well, is this equal to 15? And perhaps we'll be lucky and we'll find it over there. So now you can see we saw jumping all over the place to be able to search your search. Okay. What do you think is the complexity of the search operation in big annotation? So the size is n. Um, will it be log of n? Just like in the earlier case when we have sorted data, will it be log of n? Or will it be log of n? Yeah, exactly. Why, and why are we doing linear? Why can't we do a binary search on this? So go back to this flowchart, right? The flowchart said we're going to take the middle, i to be the middle index, and we're going to jump to the middle of the linked list, in this case, and we're going to make a comparison, right? But can we jump to the middle of the linked list? Can we jump to the middle of the linked list? Even though, even if we know the size, let's say the size is 100, yes? Exactly, exactly. So now, uh, the beauty of the array, which was that you could jump to an arbitrary location, as long as you knew the index number, is no longer there in the linked list. If you want to get to the ith element, you have to go through i iterations, and if you're going to the fourth element or the 40th element, the time involved is going to be a lot different. Okay? And for the 40th element, you have to go through 40 iterations. So now you can see the major difference between an array and a linked list. <coughs> so the search is, as you said, is not going to be big O of log n. It's going to be, unfortunately, n. So it's going to be big O of n to be able to do a search. Okay. Now let's take a look at how would you actually insert. Okay, so let's say that we're trying to insert into this linked list, and we now have, know how to do a search. Um, now we want to do an insert, but it has to be kept sorted. Okay. So essentially, what it means is that as you're going through the linked list, the first element has to be smaller than the next, and this has to be smaller. So if you want to insert a 10, where should it be inserted? Clearly between 3 and 15. So let's assume that we're inserting, and we create an object, and we say, well, the contents are going to be 10, because that's the number, but it's also going to have an address, which is going to be the address of the next object. So, what do you think the address of the next object should be? Is it inserted in an in order? So, 
So what should be the address of the next object? Yes, 700, exactly. So the content, the, the address should be 700. Why is that? Because basically we need to point to the next object in the linked list. Now, what else do we need to do to make the linked list complete? Yeah. So let's assume that this address is 800. So when you know when you're creating that object, you're going. It's obviously going to come with an address, which is fine. But keep going. Um, what do we do with that address? Yeah. Yes. So now the previous node has to point to address to this address. So now we have to update this to be 800. And so essentially what we've done is we've changed this pointer and now we have a pointer from the node, the second node to this new object and this new object located at 800 is now pointing to the subsequent address to the last node. Okay. So that's how you actually, if you, if you write this code, this has to be done manually. And you're going to be doing things like this in the next assignment, in assignment number three. Okay? Where you're going to be working with linked lists and different operations on that. <laughs> now, um, this was fine. And this is essentially what we've done is we've created, um, uh, um, we've created a new node and we've changed some pointers. Okay? Now, this is, let's take a look at a delete operation. Okay. So let's say that we have the same, the modified linked list, and now 10 has already been inserted. And so now we need to do is let's say that we want to delete this particular number, which has been inserted. And I've renumbered this to be 700 and 800. Let's assume that these are the addresses that it started off with. Now, in order to do a delete, what we have to do is we'll sort of have to traverse this linked list. And what do you mean by traversing? So what we can do is use another pointer. And I'm going to call this pointer P as opposed to the H pointer, which is constant, which is always pointing to the first node. So the P pointer could be used to start off pointing to the first node. And we want to uh, delete number 10. So we start off over here and we say, well, is the contents of the first node equal to 10? No. So now we not need to go to the next node. So now we're going to take P and use this pointer over here to change the location of P to point to 600. So P would basically be 600. We say, well, is the object located at 600, the field, the contents of that equal to 10? Uh, no. So we are now going to go to the next object and we make P equal to 10. And let's say that we've reached this point and we say, well, the contents are now equal to the number that we're trying to delete. And so we found our node that we want to delete. Okay. Now the question is, how do we actually delete that node? What changes would be required in the linked list to, to remove node 10? And this would be exactly the opposite of what we did when we're doing insertion, right? So it should be relatively easy. What changes would be required? Yeah. Yeah, so the previous node has to point to the address which is given over here, okay? Um, and that basically says that now we're bypassing this particular node which after we're done with this bypass does it has it really been deleted from the memory it's not really been deleted from the memory right it still exists you haven't cleared up that space so normally what happens is that as i've mentioned um, you could have a, what is called a garbage collector which basically goes around and clears up many objects which have no pointers to it okay that's just a sign but now we still haven't addressed a fundamental issue that let's say we have the P pointer 
and we're going iterating through this linked list. We have the P pointer initially pointed to 500, then 600, then 700. We realize we found the node that we want to delete, but now we need to change the previous node's address, or we need to change the previous node's next address. We need to change the speed. How do we do that? Or will we change the previous node because we actually we've gone beyond that, right? We've gone to the next node. So how do we change this value over here? And how how could you modify the algorithm so that we somehow can change can change the previous node's value as well? Yeah? Do you have an answer? So what we could do is inside the algorithm just keep track of the previous node. Right? So we could have a separate pointer, Q, which points to the previous node. So every time we go to the next node, we have another variable Q, which simply keeps track of the previous node. Okay, so when P is here, be before we go from 700, before we go from 600 to 700, we set Q to be equal to the previous node's address. And so if we have that, then essentially what we can do is, when we eventually find the node that we're trying to delete, and we say, aha, we found the node, but we also have a previous pointer. And so now what we can do is change the contents over here to point to 800. Okay. So this would essentially be, if you had to write the code for this, this is how you'd actually do it. But when we actually take a look at the code for USMS and other examples, we will actually see this in, in action.